Okay, so I cheated a little bit. That is actually not playback from the session. That is our final mixed orchestral version of this main title, which included um, the stems that I've created down here for our mix session, and then the data that you see in the tracks window is what I use to make the MIDI mock-up um, and what I use to, to, to compose, uh, do the arrangement of the main title. I wanted to bring my DP session for Mozart in the Jungle, like an ungroomed version. This is not like cleaned up for this presentation. I kind of wanted to show a warts and all um, representation of how I work in my studio. I know my way around most other sequencing programs. They all have their things that, are, that they're good at, but I just always have come back to DP and I'm just comfortable there. And um, that's where I live. So, Mozart in the Jungle, is a uh, Amazon television series having to do with uh, the behind the scenes looks at a look at a classical music um, world and specifically a particular orchestra in New York City. Now, you can see the name of the sequence up here, Mozart in the Jungle, episode 104, DP session. So what this means is that sometime during the fourth episode of Mozart in Jungle, first season, they asked me to write a main title or arrange the main title. So I put, I did this within the template that already it's had set up working on the episode. I don't know about, about the rest of y'all, but I, when I'm working on a, on a piece of music, I love working in the, in the chunks because I will, I will do sketches in a chunk, like I will do something like this, uh, this version, and then I will work with that for a while. Then I will save that and then copy and paste it into a new chunk and work on that one and then a new one and work on that one so that I have a, uh, an easy to access representation of any place I was working on before. Like if I was working yesterday, uh, I might save that chunk with yesterday's date and then um, open, up a, and, uh, open up a new chunk with today's date. Now that's particularly valuable under the following scenario, um, which I can explain in a second. This particular chunk we had that I just played for back is called, uh, oh, Empty Sketch Jason. Uh, the uh, executive producer of Mozart in the Jungle was, is Jason Schwartzman, who um, during the time we were working on this main title uh, was camped out in my, in my studio for about three days. So, it's, uh, which is super fun because he's a, he's a fun guy and actually a good musician. But what that me meant is that I would work on uh, my arrangement for a while while he was gone and then Jason would come in and I'd have to do a bunch of quick changes all over the place. I always wanted to make sure I had a chunk of, a, of where I was before Jason walked in because when he's in there, I'm making changes so quickly that I can do some like really dumb stuff and I need to like, always re revert back to what I was working on yesterday. Now, I'm gonna break down this composition a little bit. The song is called Listomania. When we were working on the show, we were trying to figure out what piece of classical music might be a good main title for Mozart in the Jungle. And um, I had a bunch of suggestions from the standard classical repertoire. It was finally our other executive producer, Roman Coppola, who suggested that we do a classical arrangement of Listomania. Uh, a couple of reasons for that. One is that it's just kind of hip sounding. Uh, two, it gave me an opportunity to feature the oboe, which starts this arrangement. Our show is about an oboe player, so that seemed appropriate. And three, um, the head of Listomania, the main guy, 
is Roman Coppola's brother-in-law. So that worked out for everybody. Um, so Phoenix wrote the song, Listomania. Oh, and also the title itself, Listomania, which has to do with uh, um, pop idol worship, 19th century pop idol worship, if you will. Okay, now the original piece that Phoenix had written starts with this really interesting little guitar groove that um, has a sort of a swing beat to it. It goes like this. That's the rhythm. So my first step when trying to figure out how to proceed was how am I going to make a piece of music? What am I going to lay it all on? What, what, what's going to be the, um, the skeleton that's going, to, that's going to drive this thing? So I try to find a, a way to um, create that sound, that rhythm, and program this little sort of beat that goes like this. I'll play it for us. Violin loop stem. Okay, so we got, that was the first element. The second element is this oboe part. Now, what you're hearing now is a live oboe, recorded not at the date. We did a 45-piece orchestra date later on, but originally, initially, I brought in Chris Bleth, one of the best uh, woodwind players in town. Uh, he recorded this part for me, and then I cut it up like you would not believe. Every single note is placed in the grid to provide that particular lock-solid rhythm. And the reason that was necessary is just that it's just really hard to get that rhythm. Later on at the recording session with Full Orchestra, we had um, a live oba player trying to play the same rhythm against that, that pulsation and they just couldn't nail it. And it was so essential for the piece of music that um, uh, that rhythm be lock solid, the, the, the melodic rhythm be lock, rock solid, lock solid into that um, pulsating string bit. So if you listen to the final version of the same piece of music with orchestra and my stamps, So now you can see which parts are live orchestra and which aren't. The, um, at this point in the, in the piece, the only thing that's live when you're at the very beginning is a sustained string note and then when the melody of the violins come in. One more time. Now you notice, um, I like to edit, I, I, I'm, I like to open QuickScribe a lot when I'm editing. This is the notation part of Digital Performer. So that actually, if all, there's also the scores around too, that is exactly how it's notated in the, um, in the score itself. So these, this, this melody here, the real violins at our recording session are playing that, but, I, but it required a good amount of teaching them how to do the swing time, which is a little, a little tricky. You follow up measure five, those who, uh, who read music. So they did a pretty good job. Um, and this is what you're hearing right now is the final mix. So we did a bit of massaging because that is not an easy rhythm to, to play. Now by contrast, just to show you where we started from, I'm gonna play you the MIDI demo of the same, the same section. So, listening to that, there is, there is 
some benefit of the accuracy of, uh, of the MIDI, because it's rock solid quantized. However, um, it doesn't sound as musical as the, uh, as the live players. OK, I'm going to move to another piece. Uh, anybody have questions about how we on this one? OK, most in the jungle. There's another, there's a movie I, I scored last year, which is a very different approach, called 20th Century Women. And I want to sort of share a little bit about how, what goes into that piece. 20th Century Women is a movie by um, Mike Mills, starring Annette Bening. And um, it's set in 1979. The director and I are very good friends and very good collaborators. And we spend a lot of time thinking about what the sound of the score would be. OK. Since it was set in 1979, we wanted to create a, a kind of score that sounded appropriate to that time period, but not retro in any way. We didn't want it to sound like um, kitschy. We wanted it to sound cool as hell. Uh, and so the way, the way we approached it is what instruments, what sounds, what sensibilities were, were available in that time period and that year. Uh, and if we were making a new score in 1979, but we wanted something that was really new and fresh, how would that sound? And that's um, how we came up with the sound of this particular movie. The main sound of the movie score from top to bottom is based on, um, well, all, all the instruments that were used are um, synthesizers and virtual synthesizers. I borrowed a friend of mine's Prophet 5 uh, and used that as the main sound of the score. And then I used um, Arturia, Arturia instruments, particularly the Salina uh, virtual instrument that Arturia makes, and used that as one of our main sounds. Now, this particular patch here, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to play this to show you the main thing that can propel this entire score. I use this particular sound as the main um, motif and sonic identification for this score. You'll hear how I built it up into a, uh, into a whole opening composition. This score, for me, ended up being extremely popular. And uh, this year, I had the, the um, good fortune of uh, being hired to do three films in a row, which um, was terrific for me. Uh, maybe some of you do more than that, but uh, for me, that was outstanding. All of these three movies were attempt with the music from this, move, from this movie, 20th Century Women. So I had to figure out different ways of realizing uh, th this sound into other movies. And, uh, and for the most part, it came down to that arpeggiating thing. That's, we love that. So we just like put that in our movie, we'll be good to go. Well, sonically, as we were approaching the score, the director and I were thinking a lot about the music of, of David Bowie and Brian Eno in the late 70s, and this is sort of like our route to get there. And in comparison to the music you heard earlier of, of uh, Most in the Jungle, which is a very conventional score approach, this was done like um, very much in the style of um, Brian Eno music from the late 70s. As I mentioned, you're trying to get a sound that was um, appropriate to that time period, 
relying heavily on the synths, but this is before the advent of uh, British synth pop. So, like, you know, was this before um, The Cure and Tears for Fears and, and uh, Duran Duran, that kind of thing. So it was a different kind of approach, a specific kind of approach from a specific time period. And fortunately, both myself and the director are old enough to know the difference between 1979 and 1983 in music. So we sort of like were able to, to um, zero in on, on what was what might have been possible in that time, in that time frame, in that era. And just to clue you in a bit of what I use, these are all different, these are, these are stems. As you can see, they're all different Salina presets. Many of them are um, running through tremulators, panning, things like that sort. And then a couple of um, Mellotron, virtual Mellotron stuff. And then um, a lot of stuff just done with a live profit where I'm simply playing a profit and um, twirling the wheels a bit and making like filter sweeps and things of that sort. So I'm going to conclude by playing this one piece of music in its entirety. It's about a minute long. movie, 20th Century Woman, had its premiere at the New York Film Festival um, at Alice Tully Hall. It was magnificent to hear this score there and hear this giant bass part just come in at the opening um, of the movie. And then its LA premiere was at the Chinese Theater and the same experience. Just to hear this kind of, hear this music, any music you write in that kind of uh, environment is wonderful. I think like, like most of you all, I am a um, I work in my home studio, which is about half the size of, of uh, our presentation area right here. And that's where I live my life. And eventually, sometimes at the end of the road, you get to like, enjoy the fruits of your labor.